Salam from the People's Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi. I'm Siddhant Ani and you're watching Daily Debrief. On the show today, it's no secret, of course, that the rich are getting richer and the poor, poorer. A new report from Oxfam tells us exactly how much. In Tunisia, the movement against President Kai Saeed is intensifying. And is Japan going to ignore international concerns and go ahead with dumping over a million cubic tons of contaminated water from the erstwhile Fukushima nuclear plant into the Pacific Ocean. First up, the richest 1% grabbed nearly two-thirds of all new wealth that's worth a whopping 42 trillion US dollars that's been created since 2020. This is almost twice as much money as the bottom 99% of the world's population. This is according to an Oxfam report entitled Survival of the Richest, which was released on January 16th to coincide with the first day of the World Economic Forum. That's the annual orgy for the world's super-rich held in the Swiss, Swiss sorry, ski resort of Davos. Extreme wealth and extreme poverty have increased simultaneously for the first time in 25 years, the report shows. And Gabriella Buscher, executive director of Oxfam in a press release on the occasion, said it like it is. I quote, While ordinary people are making daily sacrifices on essentials like food, the super-rich have outdone even their wildest dreams. Just two years in, this decade is shaping up to be the best yet for billionaires. A roaring 20s boom for the world's richest. End quote. Joining us for details on this scathing indictment of trickle-down economics is Dr. Abdul Rahman. Welcome back to the show. Uh, Abdul, good to have you in studio. Uh, it's a new year and I, we're having a conversation that I feel like we had probably exactly a year ago. Uh, when the super rich of the world for the last previous time uh, descended on Davos for mm. the first time, I think, after the pandemic. Uh, and timed with it was the launch of Oxfam's report on global inequality. Uh, the report is out again. And for the first time in 25 years, extreme poverty uh, is on the up, on the increase, yeah. uh, while extreme richness is also growing. Uh, summarize for us the report in terms of key findings and numbers, please. See, uh the report, if you see in its totality, will not be much different from what it was uh, in the last year, except for the fact that they are having much more detailed uh, set of statistics, Data. which basically talks about how uh, the, uh, the expropriation of wealth, what they call the capturing of the wealth by mm. the rich, ha Rabbit. has mm. increased tremendously uh, in the last two years, first two years of the decade. That's what they're saying. And they're saying that the pace of expropriation, the pace of uh, capturing of the wealth by the rich has increased if we compare it with the last decade. Mm. So last decade, they were saying that it is around 54%, uh, sorry, 54% uh, of the wealth, uh, all the wealth created in the decade mm. was acquired by the rich, the super rich, 1% 1 of the uh, world's population. This time, it is uh, first two years, 63% of the wealth has been acquired by the rich. So the rest of the people, 99% uh, of the world's population is only getting the rest, 37% uh, uh, of the wealth. In terms, in, uh, in uh, absolute terms, uh, uh, around $42 trillion of the wealth, which was created uh, uh, in two years, mm. uh, uh, $26 trillion were expropriated by 1% of the world's population and only $16 trillion reached the rest. It, in, in other terms, a, a billionaire adds around $2.17 uh, uh, billion every day to its wealth. Uh, and in terms of dollar, if you see, if a person earns $1, rest of the population, 90% of the population, if uh, they'd earn $1, a millionaire adds to uh, 1.17 uh, million dollars to its uh, 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 wealth already. Mm. So when you, while you are earning one dollar, they are earning 1.1 million dollars. That's the difference. So that is the level of inequality in the world. Which, uh, so that is the primary focus of the report. Apart from that, also they have country-specific uh, details saying that how in India, for example, mm. uh, uh, 10 uh, individuals own around 40% of the uh, national wealth. Uh, that uh, the inequality is uh, so stark Stimely. in a country which is which has the largest number of poor has increased has uh, has uh, saw increase in the overall uh, number of billionaires in the in the country. Mm. Uh, apart from that, it also talks about uh, how uh, in, at the global level uh, the uh, uh, because of these. Uh, 
inequalities which are increasing because of the lack of taxation and so on and so forth, the, the, the countries, particularly the poorer countries mm. uh, in the world, uh, are not able to uh, uh, spend uh, uh, enough on their basic uh, social services. Yeah. Uh, that basically creating further inequalities, which is creating pro poverty and uh, which is uh, which hunger, uh, hunger and other things. Yeah. 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 Uh, just focusing on that uh, taxation aspect uh, for a minute, Abdul, because I guess as a proposal to get the world out of this situation, mm -hmm. the report points to how, for example, some poor countries are f spending four times more on financing exactly. debt than they are on things like healthcare. Mm -hmm. Taxation seems the only means or the only way out. Taxation and, of course, then redistribution of, of that wealth. Uh, sort of expand on, on that idea a little bit. Well, uh, that is one aspect of the report, which basically is the most significant, if you ask me, because the inequalities are rising and other things we know. Uh, by and large, uh, there had been reports uh, in previous years also about uh, talking about the same things. Uh, but it emphasizes and very strongly emphasizes that the whole idea of trickle down, uh, one of the uh, executive director of the Ox firm basically said in the press uh, re uh, release mm. that the, this idea of trickle down, which was uh, uh, the mantra mm. of the neoliberal uh, uh, period mm. since 1990s, late 80s, early 90s, uh, that low taxation, low tax rate uh, creates further wealth and which the wealth reaches to the poor is has completely failed. We have seen it does not work. Uh, uh, and it is it only creates wealth at the top mm. and the rest of the at, at the cost of the rest of the people yeah. so if you want to uh, kind of control this inequality and inequalities are not uh, something which is uh, innocent it, it creates dangers to mm. democracy to the society and so on and so forth yeah. so if you want to control it and you want to save the democracy save other uh, in, invest more money on innovation invest money, more money on uh, climate uh, uh, to control cli climate change and so so and so forth you need to increase the taxes for the rich and uh, it talks about windfall again uh, tax it talks about other things but it basically talks about reducing the uh, the emphasis on the indirect taxes for example the gst or the vat and mm. so on and so forth mm. and increasing the direct taxes on income mm. yeah. and wealth uh, it, it is very uh, uh, interesting statistic which the report gives that uh, most of the wealth owned by the rich uh, 1% is inherited wealth mm. not earned by these people mm. it is it is a, a windfall from the investments they make. So they do not uh, do any labor. Mm. Whatever uh, the money they are getting is basically inherited or is basically <laughs> a product of the wealth they already had. Yeah. And therefore, fry, uh, they give a, a strange number, I mean, a strong number that around $5 trillion is inherited uh, by the uh, rich heirs of the uh, uh, rich parents mm. uh, in the world and, and and that is more than the entire GDP of Africa. Mm. So we need to increase taxes and we, we need to increase taxes on uh, directly on the income uh, to basically have uh, enough money for the welfare and they give the example of uh, how the higher taxes during the 70s, early 70s and 80s before that, before, after the first second world war basically created a, a situation where the economic growth happened at the time at, at simultaneously with a larger development hmm. uh, in social education and sector education and health also. Right. So we need to kind of Im imitate that, that regime. Period. All right. Thanks very much, Abdul. Stick around because we're talking about Tunisia next and marking the anniversary actually of the movement uh, that kicked off uh, what is known as Arab Spring. Uh, so we'll, we'll be back with you in a minute. Thousands marched uh, in the Tunisian capital and other parts of the country on January 14th against President Kais Saeed's slide into authoritarian rule, demanding he step, out, step down from office and reinstate the democratic objectives of the movement that overthrew Zeyn al Abidin Ben Ali back in 2011 and launched the so-called Arab Spring revolutions around the region. The Central Avenue in, Tuni uh, in Tunis, uh, which was a key site for the revolution, was crowded once again on Saturday, with thousands of protesters waving flags and chanting that the people demand the fall of the regime. There was, of course, heavy police presence as well. The protests come after disastrous parliamentary elections last month, in which just about 10% of the population cast their votes. 
there will, uh, despite all the protests, of course, be a runoff election to follow on the 29th of January. Abdul is still with us in studio uh, and has more on uh, this developing story. Abdul, uh, the Tunisian economy as well as, uh, of course, politically, there's all kinds of uh, turmoil as well. Uh, the economy is not in good shape at all and people once again took to the streets on uh, this important day in the history of Tunisia uh, to voice their discontent. Uh, what's the latest? Well, on, uh, on the anniversary uh, of Ben Ali's uh, removal from the power, uh, uh, 14th of January, there was a huge uh, demonstration, uh, in, not only in Tunis, but in different other parts of Tunisia, uh, which, which has a context. Uh, uh, similar to Ben Ali, there is a, a, a kind of a coup leader, mm. uh, uh, which all the political parties, majority of the political parties in Tunisia agree to. Mm. So there is, you can find some kind of similarity and there is an anger about uh, Kais Saeed uh, stealing uh, the, uh, the, uh, the achievement uh, one uh, success story from the so-called Arab Spring in 2011. Uh, uh, for, uh, in 2021, uh, there was uh, what is considered as a coup, mm. and the people are angry at it. And that anger was expressed on uh, the on Saturday. Uh, a huge gathering demanded uh, Kais Saeed's resignation, and uh, it also raised uh, concerns about going back to. Ben Ali's uh, period, where one person, Kais Saeed's so-called new constitution, mm. talks about how it has created a presidential system, mm. it has a, a kind of centered uh, power in hands of the president, and that basically was the Ben Ali's uh, system. So people are worried about that, and, and there is a huge political movement going on in Tunisia for last one year and so, and uh, it seems on Saturday that uh, on the anniversary of Ben Ali's removal, it was repeated, the protest demonstrations happened. And um, there are, uh, the, by the way, in meanwhile, Tunisia is also, uh, the Kais Saeed government is also conducting, them, is going to conduct a second round of uh, elections which happened in December, and then only 11% people participated in, mm -hmm. in it. It seems uh, uh, Kais Saeed is not getting the hint of, or not having any uh, uh, kind of understanding of what the popular mood is. But and uh, he has uh, asked his administration to continue with the second round of elections, which will happen on 29th January. So yeah, that is the uh, situation. situation. Uh, in in terms of the opposition movement, uh, a lot of it which is being led by the Workers' Party and uh, unions like the UGTT. Uh, what can we expect? Sort of an intensification of this uh, struggle on the ground. It looks like that there is already a, a, a talks about a kind of there. In fact, uh, if you see the history in last one year, Inahada and its ideological affiliates have created a big group. Mm. So Saturday's protests were not organized by one political party. party. The Inahada organized one set of protests mm. and the Workers' Party, the left wing, organized another set of protests. And those of protests were simultaneously held at different uh, locations and, and the popular participation was huge in both the protests. Mm. So there is already a set of groups which, of course, ideologically, there is a division, there is a difference, mm. there are differences. Mm. But despite those differences, there is one common uh, point. Yeah. Kais Saeed is dangerous to Tunisia's democracy. Uh, he came to power. There is an understanding that he came to power uh, because of the failures of the post-Arab uh, uh, Spring political uh, leadership in mm. Tunisia, mm. which failed to tackle the economic issues in, con in the country, failed to fulfill, even to a limited extent, the aspiration of the youth in the country, which participated in the uh, removal of Ben Ali, a movement against the Ben Ali. Nothing uh, what they expected from the post-Ben uh, uh, Ali governments did not happen. And in fact, the Tunisia basically plunged into uh, different kinds of corruption and inefficiency and so on and so forth. That was the reason that Kais Saeed was elected. Mm. But none of the uh, electorates, it seems, were ready to accept a, a new regime which basically wants talks about efficiency, talks about dealing with corruption, but with the tools which were used by, by a, Ben Ali and, and, and what they call the dictatorship. Mm. And, and, and that is the, it seems, that is the 
point which is sticking mm. uh, with the larger masses mm. and that is the reason that the uh, popular protests are increasing. If you see the mobilizations which were there earlier uh, uh, when the uh, July 25th, 2020, when he, 21, when he removed uh, the government, mm. the, the numbers were smaller. Now the numbers are increasing with each protest and right. UGTT coming into the, uh, uh, into the movement has in fact further uh, intensified the, uh, 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 the agitations. And it seems if this continues, if Kais Said has not learned his lessons, it, the movement will be stronger in the coming days. All right. Thanks very much for both those uh, updates, uh, Abdul. And finally, Japan will release more than a million tons of contaminated water into the sea from the destroyed Fukushima nuclear plant uh, later this year, starting in either spring or the summer. Japan's chief secretary, chief cabinet secretary, that is, uh, Hirokazu Matsuno, made the announcement. The International Atomic Agency says the proposal is safe, but neighboring countries have voiced serious concerns and called for an inclusive, consultative decision-making process on what to do with this wastewater. The 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster was the worst of its kind since Chernobyl, and the decommissioning of the plant will take anywhere up to 40 years. Every day, it produces over 100 cubic meters of contaminated water. It's a mixture of groundwater, of course, as well as seawater, and water used to keep the reactors cool. This is then filtered and stored in tanks. Uh, with over a million cubic meters already on site, space at Fukushima is running out. Anish joins us for more details on this story. Anish, despite uh, what seems like opposition or criticism from everyone except the United States of America, Japan is going ahead uh, with plans to dump uh, over a million tons of uh, contaminated uh, water from the Fukushima nuclear plant area into the ocean. Uh, what, what's the latest on it? What are local fishing communities, for example, uh, protesting against at this point? Yeah, so let's begin with the fact that uh, Japan is uh, trying to treat it as um, an issue of not contaminated water being uh, dumped into the ocean, but as treated water that is being dumped into the ocean. They claim that they have treated it very rigorously and that the most harmful of radioactive waste has been taken out, except for uh, tri tritium, which uh, they claim is not uh, harmful to the environment or for humans uh, in uh, small quantities. Now, the thing is, uh, we do not know what these small quantities are. It's not been explained well. Uh, we do not know uh, what will be the level of, uh, you know, dumping this, uh, how long it will take, uh, you know, how long these uh, waste will be exposed to the ocean either. So one of that, that is one of the things that uh, the fishing community are very concerned about it is because the plan is not exactly quite clear how it will start, but it is set to start very soon. They're saying that it will begin by spring of this year, or maybe, uh, you know, if it's late, but it would still be happening by summer of this year. So uh, this is a, a problematic thing. Uh, there is very, uh, there is not enough transparency on the matter apart from the announcements that they have made. And uh, if, uh, for the firstly, the fishing community are concerned about the fact that the wastewater will affect their livelihoods, uh, it will affect a uh, marine ecosystem that can affect their uh, harvest seasons and so on, or for the matter that uh, there can be like a market-wide uh, paranoia that can affect their livelihoods, their, uh, you know, a possibility to sell their products uh, into the market. Uh, even within Japan to begin with, mm. let alone uh, outside the country. So these factors are obviously uh, something that concerns them. This is very similar to the, uh, to the concerns that fisher folk in the Pacific are uh, worried about, uh, and not just the Pacific, but also uh, in, uh, China and South Korea and even Australians uh, are quite, quite concerned about how this will impact uh, their marine ecosystem. And the problem is, the bigger problem is that uh, Japan is not entirely clear of how its plan is, because obviously this is part of the entire decommissioning process of the mm -hmm. Fukushima, uh, or what used to be the Fukushima nuclear power plant, uh, which will take about three to four decades. Uh, and, and obviously taking out the wastewater is one of the, one of the first step towards that process. So it needs to be done, obviously. Uh, but uh, 
independent studies are lacking. There has been studies by the IAEA, and which is, uh, but the report is yet to be published. Uh, there are already concerns being raised by United Nations human rights uh, uh, investigators. Three of them, at least, have raised concerns, especially those concerned, those in, involved in human rights with respect to environment, with respect to food, with respect to livelihoods. And uh, they have raised ma massive concerns about the fact that we do not really have the data to be sure that the kind of uh, wastewater being dumped will be safe for everybody involved. Right. Thanks very much for that update, Anish. That's a wrap for this episode of The Daily Debrief. For more details on these stories and all of the other work we do, we invite you, as always, to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org. And of course, don't give, uh, forget to follow us on the social media platform of your choice. We'll be back same time, same place tomorrow. Until then, goodbye.